Hi, everyone. Um, thank you all for joining us in this session. Um, and thank you, our networks, for hosting. Um, my name is Marie, and I'm here with Lauren. Hey. And um, we'd like to talk to you about our project with Low Tech Magazine, um, which is a blog that discusses um, the use of past knowledge or technologies to design a, a forward-looking sustainable society. Um, and we initially began this project with Chris Decker, who is the editor and founder of Low Tech Magazine. Um, and we also received some funds from our school. We were going to uh, a graduate program at RISD at that time. But basically with this project, um, we wanted to explore the question of what is a low tech sustainable infrastructure for publishing, um, both in online and print. So we'd like to present um, the solar powered website that we came up as a radical redesign of this blog that he had already had. And it's a website that is self hosted on a solar powered server. And we also have an accompanying print publication for this. So this, uh, um, it's two of us um, presenting today, but this uh, has been a collaborative project with Chris and also another artist researcher, Roel Roskin Abing who worked on a lot of the hardware setups in the back end of the site as well. So um, since we were focusing on the de design, our talk today would be focusing on kind of like the design strategy of how to reflect this infrastructure of the site or the publishing platform within um, what we see as the design. Um, so I think we're gonna jump now to some um, documentation about our site as we go through our features. When we began working with Krista Decker, the site was set up on TypePad, um, which works similarly to WordPress. It's um, a dynamic blogging platform. So as you can see, it kind of uses uh, an existing theme um, and doesn't have as much consideration about how the design reflects the mission of the website. And so we asked from here, what is a low-tech website? As you all may know, this is what the web began as. No styles, just marked up text. Um, and we took this original site as inspiration for a new website. Many of you may have already seen this, um, but this is one answer to what a low tech website can be. But it's the absolute minimum and doesn't really offer the audience some experience that really facilitates engaging with the content. Um, it's also typographically really hard to read. For example, the measures are super long and that doesn't, that doesn't lead for a very readable experience. And we also wanted a design that doesn't just support the content, but it also exposes the underlying infrastructure of the site. And so that is how we arrived at the solar version of our low tech magazine. So I'll now go over a few features of this new design. So the first thing you'll see is our new low-tech magazine identity system. So this is a new approach where we, instead of using an image, we're using a typographic move. So most redesigns, they center around a logo type that is a specific defined image. Um, but what this entails is a whole system of images in various formats, EPS, that needs to get sent out every time that logo needs to be used. So we simplified to just a left-facing arrow. And this is drawing from the original masthead of the spear, where it was symbolizing how a low-tech weapon is used against the claims of high-tech progress. And initially, um, we were using the Unicode for the arrow. And this is also something that's great where in the case that the glyph isn't included in the default typeface of the browser, any symbol font will replace it. And this fallback feature is often something designers try to avoid at all costs. But in our case, we wanted to leverage this. And then after launching, we also noticed that some have used uh, a less than sign and a hyphen in in lieu of an arrow, which also feels like um, a different, just like a different version of this and is acceptable. 
So really our identity system is calling for more conceptual and material consistency rather than a visual uniformity where it looks exactly the same in every situation. Instead, it adapts to the conditions of its environment and its um, platform. Another part of this design is uh, the default typeface that you're seeing. So this, this Times New Roman that you're seeing right here is a browser default. And by using the default typeface, it avoids us having to load more assets. And it also reiterates the role of the browser in website access. So it emph emphasizes the, the web browser as another node in this whole infrastructure of the web. And also, we're only using one weight of the font to also demonstrate that you can establish typographic hierarchy without needing to load all these different weights of a particular typeface. And the lack of a declared font also empowers the user to customize the look and feel of this reading experience. So for example, this is in Firefox, they can go into their preferences and change um, the default typeface, let's say they wanted to send serif, and you'd be able to see and read the site in your preferred typeface. So the lightest websites you would see will exist without any images or graphical elements, like the first website we showed. It's just text. But imagery is an important part of Chris's content. Um, a lot of them are explanatory and would require images for the reader to understand what's going on. So we use several different techniques to minimize the server data load for images, um, including heavily compressed images, um, some SVGs, and also image sprites. And here I'd like to focus um, on these dithered images that you're seeing. So instead of using full color high resolution images, which is currently kind of in the trend of web design, having all these full screen high res images, we chose to convert all images into black and white using a, a custom dithering plugin. Um, this is something Roll developed for us. And it's true that certain images are better suited for particular forms of compression, but our goal was to not only compress the images, but also to call attention to this act of compression. So it was to really make visible these dithered moments. And also considering that the majority of articles um, feature black and white ar archival imagery, it made sense that using a file format that um, plays with a limited color palette would make sense. And these black and white images are simply um, colored using CSS blend modes according to the kind of article they are. So low-tech solutions articles are blue, high-tech problems are red images, obsolete technology articles are in green. And what's nice is that these dithered images can be stretched beyond their actual image size to really emphasize this dithered aesthetic. And these artifacts of the compression process becomes an integral part of this design. And as mentioned earlier, um, this web website is running on a small microcomputer powered um, server. Uh, this is how the setup looks like, and it's powered by a solar panel installed on Chris's balcony. Kind of like this. And to reflect this in the design, we decided to have a constant battery meter. So this background color that you see is the battery meter. So this is there to always display the relationship of the energy powering the website and the visitor traffic consuming it. And we thought that this height of the battery meter is a great way to visualize this relationship between supply and demand. And when the icon is a sun, it means that the meter is charging. So it's currently charging in Barcelona. When it is in um, a battery mode, it means that the meter is depleting and that we are running on stored power. 
and a decreasing meter height then indicates that the remaining time of the website is limited. So in order to help the audience plan when to visit the site, we are showing um, a weather forecast. And that's something that's available down in the footer of the site. So here you see some server stats and the weather for the upcoming few days. Something that comes up a lot is that we could have easily used a larger battery for better reliability. But the purpose of this redesign was to call attention to the web's energy use and to challenge our expectations for a power-hungry 24-7 internet. So our goal is not 100% uptime. To touch a bit on the back end of the site, we used a static site generator called Pelican for a content management system. Um, so because static sites are based on file storage, they consume us much less energy than dynamic sites like WordPress um, that require the server to constantly regenerate the site. Um, um, this is a diagram I drew for Chris when I was trying to explain how all these components fit together. Um, and there's a lot involved, but we wanted the site to point out certain key elements like the solar panel server, how it is powered by a battery or the solar energy, how the browser plays a role in this whole ecosystem. Um, one last thing to mention about the site is that the new version of the site features printer-friendly styling. And we often assume that consuming something digitally is more sustainable, but this isn't always the case. So, especially if you're reading outside for a long time on max screen brightness, you're used consuming a lot of energy. And in that case, printing might be a better option. So if printing is necessary for certain circumstances, we wanted to design a print version of this site that was as resourceful as its web content that maximizes space. So if I try to print this, I'm going to open this in preview instead of actually printing it. But this is how uh, the printed website would look like. And so as you can see, it also maximizes the, the space on the page and the type size is set to something that is more appropriate for reading off screen. Now Lauren will talk us through the motivations and considerations behind the book design and what it means to, for us to print a website. So from the beginning, we knew that we wanted to make a book for a few different reasons. The first was sort of just that the articles on Low Tech Magazine are really long, they're pretty dense, they're pretty technical, and an offline reading experience is really preferable for many of the website's users. Um, and then we also knew that with the solar power website, there would be times of cloudiness or high traffic where the website would go offline. And we wanted to give readers a way to always have access to the content. And it was also a way to give Low Tech Magazine a physical archive, a way to ensure that there is a preservation of all of this content because the future of the internet really is uncertain and to rely on that as the archive isn't a guarantee. So with that, we knew that we wanted to also apply Low Tech Magazine's mission to the idea of the book, both in its production and in its design. So we started first by looking into production and searching environmentally friendly publishing approaches. And most of these results advertise recycled paper and soy-based inks. And we sort of, after that cursory look, we thought that with a little bit of research, we'd be able to find sort of the one approach that would give us the quote unquote green solution. Um, but as we dug deeper, we realized that there were so many different metrics that we could choose from and that were sort of competing with each other and that so much of what was labeled as green was more of a stamp than really anything that was digging beneath looking at more structural ideas of what a quote-unquote green book would look like. So for us, we had to narrow down those metrics and figure out what was most important. And we honed in on paper, the printing process, ink usage, and the shipping. And so paper is a huge factor in environmental printing, and it's actually surprisingly debated. 
Um, recycled paper definitely uses less energy to make, but to get recycled paper back to being white again, it's bleached. And so along with being a chemically intensive uh, process that also really shortens the lifespan of the paper after that and its ability to be reused for their times. Um, we also looked into inks and really the conversation was often about soy based inks being kind of the go-to solution but we also found some instances of people talking about vegetable based inks being sort of the even more green solution uh, and what we really couldn't find was a lot of conversations about ink usage and how just how many how much ink we're putting on the page is a huge factor in how we're producing this book. And so we knew from the get-go that we wanted to cross out large swaths of ink. So you'll see that the book is mostly white with black text and there's not really any, there's no black page with white text. There's no moments of really big ink usage. Um, and a big part of what we then started to consider was what typeface we would use. And there's sort of this idea that certain typefaces are more environmentally friendly than others. And while some of them are definitely thinner or they use gaps to print down less ink, what we found was a lot of the conversations were totally kind of irrelevant. Um, one of the things we saw a lot of was saying something like Garamond, a typeface, is the most environmentally friendly typeface, but what it failed to consider was that type sizes aren't always, aren't, uh, two different typefaces at the same type size aren't necessarily the same height. And so you can see here, this is Garamond on the left at 12 point and Helvetica on the right at 12 point. And you see that Helvetica is taller than Garamond. So conceivably Helvetica is using less ink. But of course there's a really simple solution to this, which is to bump Helvetica down one point size and there we have it at the exact same height at Garamond. And so we really couldn't find this sort of silver bullet typeface answer that we were looking for. And another process that we really had to consider was the printing. Um, laser printing here in the top left is a really energy intensive process. It, the way it fuses ink to the paper is through heat, running the paper through these hot drums, and that's why it feels so nice to pick up a piece of paper from a laser printer and it's all warm. Um, but we knew that this wasn't necessarily the best answer and so we had to look around for other processes. So we looked at the risograph printer which is an older printer but is still produced and it runs cold instead of hot so the ink sinks into the paper as opposed to being fused with it and that's a much less energy intensive process. And we uh, even looked into writing a full copy of the 710 page book on a typewriter or a dot matrix printer, which in terms of our time commitment we were willing to do, but what we realized was that the scanning process needed for the manuscript to become a mass reproducible book would basically use the same processes as the other forms of printing. And finally, we had to consider the shipping process, both from an environmental point of view and a just purely logistical standpoint. Because Low Tech Magazine is based in Barcelona, but the bulk of its readers are actually in the United States. And so if we had used a European printer, which would, is arguably more convenient and more affordable, Low Tech Magazine would end up having to ship the books across the Atlantic anyways. And... That's also an extremely labor-intensive process that runs the risk of ending up with a surplus of books. If people don't buy every single copy, then we've got all this both labor and resources that have been totally wasted. So the process that we finally found that really made the most sense for Low Tech Magazine and its values was... Um, to use print-on-demand processes. So this is where you only print a book once it's ordered, so there's no surplus buying. And the company we chose also had a network of international printers, so books were printed and shipped from a location much closer to the buyer than if Low Tech Magazine were to ship them.
to get into sort of the specifics of the design of the book, the first thing we did was justify the type so that it filled up the entire line. So if you look on the left side of the spread, that type is filling up all the way to the right, whereas on the right side, the type runs ragged. And it's a really tiny difference in the amount of space that the text takes up, but you're able to fit more text on a line when it's justified type. And over the course of such a long book, that really made a difference in being able to fit as much content as possible. We also wanted to maximize how many pages were in the book based on the resources that both go into producing and shipping it. So we printed as many pages as possible into this book so that we could really, both the reader felt like they were getting a huge chunk of Low Tech Magazine's archive and that it really justified everything that went into making it as opposed to something like a 100-page book, which requires basically the same resources but offers a lot less to the reader. Um, with the justified type, what it also accentuates is the fact that we have a, a modular gutter throughout the book. So the gutter is the space in, in the center of the book in between the two pages. And this is space that's given based on how hard it is to open the book so that words don't fall down into the crack when it's open. So you can see here in this early prototype, hadn't set the gutter deep enough to prevent the words from falling into it. And because this book is 700 pages, we needed to lose over one inch of the page to the gutter space. However, it's easier to open a book in the beginning and the end than it is in the center. And so to set that 1.25 gutter space throughout the whole book isn't actually really necessary. So what we landed on was a modular gutter. So if you watch the center of these spreads, you'll see that the book gets that the gutter space gets wider and then comes back down at the end. And this allowed us to really maximize the page space and put as much text as possible. Uh, along with that, we also dithered images like on the website. So this was sort of a really nice complementary element to the website in that they both used dithered images, but they actually served very different purposes. So for the book, you need a much higher quality image for print than you do for the web. And so this allowed us to take what were low res images on the web and scale them up to be print size. And it also uses less ink because they're not full swaths, but instead little dots making up the images. And the type size is relatively large for the book, but without an ebook or printing a large print version, this guaranteed that the type could be read by a wide audience without any more production. We didn't need to make a second book or an ebook. So, any questions? Thoughts? Immediate responses? <laughs> okay. So, um, Maybe I missed it, but did you guys compare the energy cost of um, somebody spending X amount of hours to um, review your web website versus um, the cost of printing? And like, I'm just wondering what that comparison would look like. What would, which one would cost more energy or, or um, yeah. I didn't quite catch the audio. So the question was, did you compare okay. the cost of energy? And I think Ben has also added it to the chat. That's a good question. We didn't do an exact sort of statistic comparison of like di those different forms of um, cons sort of consuming the content. I think we were just more thinking of there are certain scenarios in which like a printed version is like the better way to see the site. And then there are certain scenarios in which um, reading it online would be better. So in either scenario, we wanted to make sure that we considered the energy used behind it. Um, and also in terms of like comparison, it's for example, with the website, we can compare the average number of bytes uh, per page compared to the old type head site. But it's in terms of just like 
absolute usage, it's really actually hard to kind of have an exact value because, you know, how far do you go down the, the system basically to measure the use? Like, do you think about how much energy went into building the batteries that is powering the site that is, you know, what resources went into, you know, build the laptop? Like, it kind of becomes really hard to get, like, absolute measurements. So in terms of comparisons, we've been trying to do it in terms of, like, what exists currently or like what is the what was the old model versus what is the new model hey, i've got a question uh is the dithering algorithm available anywhere because it's really nice and it looks good and i'd quite like to use it i'm sorry could you have that repeated um it's also in the in the chat uh the dithering algorithm is it available uh, anywhere Oh yeah, um, that that's available. Um, I can add some links onto the um, the program um, link. Basically, it's it, it's I think set up to a GitHub issue, so I can up that update that. But it's a it's a Python um, written plugin, and um, that role is managing, and it's part of the theme that is also open source. Um, it hasn't really been um, fully configured to be completely like plug and play, like usable for any kind of site. It's, I, I've just posted the code for our particular site online, but all of that is built available to use. Um, and I think we have one last question. Hello. Um, I've seen your site uh, several times, but I've never seen it when the battery is gone and there's no site available. So I was curious, what does a user see when the battery is gone? And um, how would a user know that the site is gone temporarily as opposed to being gone forever? That is a really good question. Um, we actually currently, I mean, currently if the site is down, they're not able to access the site. Like there, there's no way to serve up like an error message basically because the server is down. Um, and there have been kind of suggestions about like having sort of like an offline copy that is served up it somehow with like a backup um, server. But then again, we're kind of thinking about like, what's the cost of having like a backup server. Um, it has, I think it was actually down maybe like a week ago um, just because there were some consecutive days of bad weather in Barcelona. But I think that's something we can think about more in terms of like the user experience of like if someone is going there for the first time, then they wouldn't really know, you know, the whole system behind the site. So yeah, I'm open to suggestions of, as well for that. Um, thank you. I think these nice, these two morning talks were a really wonderful exploration of these really granular attempts to think about how we deploy our values through design. Um, and um, unfortunately, we don't have more time. Uh, I have many questions I want to follow up with you both <laughs> after, too. So could you uh, join me in thanking uh, Lauren and Marie? Thank you.